Jai Hind, Namaste and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the day's program by Center for Knowledge Sovereignty. I also extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker of the day, veteran Lieutenant General D.S. Hudda, sir. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. It is our pleasure to have you with us for the second time today on our concluding talk. Before I introduce the speaker, I will briefly introduce our think tank, CKS. CKS is a non-partisan nationalistic think tank established more than a decade back with focus on the spheres of information technology, geospatial technology, public policy, research, national security, along with the geopolitics. CKS has been a pioneer in spreading awareness about data sovereignty and cybersecurity at strategic, political, and national levels. Please do visit our website, www.cks.org, to know more and for regular updates. I am also requesting everyone to follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well to stay updated. Over the past few years, CKS is privileged to host on its platform several discussions, roundtables, in person, and since COVID-19, we have initiated virtual discussions as well. The Spake Generals is one such program which has completed four seasons with very large viewership. Today, we are happy to have our final talk of the fifth season of our highly acclaimed flagship webinar, The Spake Generals. In the last four seasons, we have had thought leaders on our platform, such as Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar, Lieutenant General Sanjay Kulkarni, Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain, Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, Air Marshal S. S. Soman, Air Vice Marshal Arjun Subramaniam, Air Marshal Anil Khosla, Lieutenant General D. S. Udda, sir, who is here with us today as well, Lieutenant General Zamir Uddin Shah, Vice Admiral Anil Chopra, Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, Rear Admiral Sudarshan Shikhande, Air Marshal D. Chaudhary, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, Lieutenant General Shokin, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, Lieutenant General Vinod Khandare, and Lieutenant General Satish Dua. In this season also, we had a very impressive lineup of acclaimed speakers. Please note that the views expressed by our speakers on this platform are their individual views and CKS is merely a platform hosting these talks. I request all the members of the audience to put their questions in the chat box addressing it to Air Vice Marshal Pranay Sinha sir at the end of the talk so that the speaker is not disturbed during his talk. We are currently live on the Facebook page of CKS and this talk will be available on the CKS YouTube channel shortly, along with all the other social media handles. Ladies and gentlemen, today in the concluding fifth talk of this season, we are honored and privileged to have a very highly acclaimed and distinguished veteran, Lieutenant General Dipender Singh Hudda, sir, former Army Commander of the Northern Command. He was commissioned into the Army on 15 December 1976. During his army career spanning 40 years, he has served in the most challenging border areas of the country and in the United Nations mission. In his last appointment as the army commander of Northern Command, he was responsible for looking after the sensitive border areas with Pakistan and China in Jammu and Kashmir, including the Siachen Glacier. It was he who meticulously planned and ensured successful execution of the famous Uri surgical strike into Pakistan in September 2016. In recognition for his exemplary military service, the general officer has been awarded the Vishisht Seva Medal twice, the Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, the Uttam Yudh Seva Medal, and the Param Vishisht Seva Medal. He is the co-founder of the Council for Strategic and Defense Research, a think tank based in Delhi, and a senior fellow at the Delhi Policy Group. Now I request Air Vice Marshal AVM Pranay Sinha, sir, VSM retired, moderator of the session to take the program further. Viewers, AVM Pranay Sinha, in his last 35 years of distinguished career, has hailed many important appointments and post-retirement he has worked as an advisor to Bharat Electronics Limited for a period of three years and is now appointed as the strategic advisor of prestigious IIT Mandi. 
He is also a very active member of our think tank and is instrumental in planning and executing this talk series. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Very good evening, viewers, and thanks, madam. Viewers, as some of you know well that Sumitra Gwenka ji is director rating Infotech, CEO Triangle Global, and our strongest pillar of strength, main sutradhar of CKS India, and a strong votary of women empowerment on TV channels. And viewers, welcome to this concluding talk, our fifth season of flagship webinar, The Speak Generals. But before I invite the scholar, soldier, general, let me contextualize the subject of the evening in a minute. Our regular viewers are aware that this tagline, The Speak Generals, is based on German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche's famous book of 1882, The Speak Jarthustra wherein he propounded the philosophy that an individual in his lifetime needs to undergo three metamorphoses because a common people generally behave as a motley cow that follows herd mentality. Therefore, one has to acquire attributes first of a camel, then the lion, and finally that of a child to discover true freedom in lifetime. And one very interesting observation he makes that one faces a dragon in a lifetime, which is a great barrier in the path of true spirit. And he proposes an antidote that evolving lion has to fight the dragon to get back the freedom and true spirit. Viewers, what a prophetic thought that is relevant even today, comparable with today's geopolitical scene around India. So the million dollar question arises, do we, on our way in becoming Atma Nirbhar land, have the might to take on the red dragon that is provocatively sitting across the Himalayas. And more so, when a slimy fox type never on the Western front that is always ready to disrupt our peaceful economic rise and attempts to divert our forces' attention by infiltrating like thieves and cowardly killing some innocent people in the hinterland. No doubt. To deal such collusive bad intended neighbors, diplomacy has a crucial role to play. After all, as opposed to war, diplomacy is the cost effective means of reconciling interests and resolving complex territorial disputes. However, still we need to develop both the national doctrine and the military capability to deal any two front war contingency as and when it arises. Because the possibility for collusion between India's two military adversaries is real. More so, fighting a two-front war is not exclusively India's choice. It would be trusted on us. Hence, it is conceptually solipsistic to think that New Delhi, through the sheer weight of its diplomacy, would exclusively be capable of preventing a two-front war from occurring. Indian diplomats and leaders can at most thought with war with both Pakistan and China, if the latter wanted. But if the two-front war is imposed on us, then what are the possibilities and what would be the contour and the nature of such scenario? Ladies and gentlemen, who else can answer this pertinent question than the former Northern Army Commander General Kuda himself? Sir, over to you. So thank you very much, uh, Air Marshal Sena, uh, for inviting me, and uh, thanks, Sumitra, for a very generous introduction. Uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here once again, uh, uh, and to be able to talk to you all. Uh, as Air Marshal Sena has brought out, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, the possibility and contours of a two-front war. Uh, obviously, I will not be going into you know the details of uh, of how operations exactly will sort of uh, pan out, but talk in uh, you know broad sort of general terms to give you an idea of one, what is the possibility, and in case this possibility happens, then what would be the contours of such a two front war? And finally, then I will come to uh, what is it that we need to do. What are the kind of capabilities uh, you know, that we need to build within the military to cater for such a contingency? 
So what is uh, simply a two-front war? Simply it is, uh, you know, when you're facing two adversaries in a war. And uh, I think uh, one classic example is Germany in Second World War, where Germany was facing uh, two adversaries uh, on, on its northern and southern borders, uh, Russia on the northern borders and France on the, on the southern borders. And the strategy that was adopted uh, by Germany at that time was uh, that to avoid fighting a two-front war, let us either defeat one adversary uh, to start with or have a, have a treaty so that we are not fighting two adversaries at a time. So they initially had a treaty with Russia uh, to say that you know, we will not uh, engage in operations against each other. Uh, and therefore, they attacked France. And after France was uh, was captured and, and capitulated, that was the time when they then struck against Russia. Uh, unfortunately, this two-front war actually uh, took a big toll on them. And at the end of Second World War, you know what happened was that uh, Germany was finally defeated, uh, fighting on fighting on both the fronts. Uh, I think one country that has successfully fought uh, not only two fronts, but multiple fronts has been has been Israel, and that's because they built up their military capability, uh, their training standards, etc., to be able to handle hostile neighbors along all their neighbors. Coming to India, you know what is the what is the possibility? What is the reality uh, of a two front war? Uh, and sometimes, you know, it is said. Uh, it used to be said definitely before 2020 uh, that look uh, sometimes you know it's the military uh, that is raising this whole bogey of a two front war. Uh, actually, a two front war is unlikely to happen, and the military is raising this bogey only because they want more resources, uh, they want more assets, they want a larger budget, and actually the two front war is unlikely to happen. But if you look at it <laughs> realistically. I mean, we are facing uh, we are facing two fronts already today. Uh, Pakistan, with whom we fought wars in 1947, 65, 71, the Kargil War. Uh, there is an ongoing border dispute in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, the number of ceasefire violations that used to happen in the past uh, enormous fighting across the border. So we know that there is already a hostile neighbor. Uh, on the west, which is Pakistan. Uh, with China too, we fought a war in 1962. We have, uh, we have a border problem along our entire 3,000 kilometer long line of actual control. And while in the past, it was felt that, you know, we, we have this series of agreements starting from 1993 uh, with China, Yes, there have been, you know, incursions take place regularly, but the border has been peaceful. The last time uh, firing took place uh, on the line of actual control and we lost some soldiers was actually 1975. After that, the border had remained completely peaceful. And so uh, the feeling was that the border is likely to remain peaceful. We have a, you know, our business interests are there. Trade is booming. Leaders are meeting each other. Uh, but I think after 2020, all that has uh, all that has changed today. Uh, China has emerged as a sort of a real, uh, you know, real military threat. Uh, we have had relocation of forces that has taken place from the Western Front towards the Chinese Front. Major relocation of forces. Even today, uh, we talk about. 60 to 100,000 soldiers in the dark facing off each other uh, across the line of active control. There is tension. All the agreements that we had uh, have broken down. Uh, and if you look, I mean, as far as Pakistan is concerned, the situation still remains the same. Uh, Pakistan still looks at uh, India as an existential threat. Uh, they keep talking about Jammu and Kashmir uh, as an unresolved sort of agenda. And so we already have these two hostile uh, neighbors. How a war will pan out, will it uh, 
will the situation escalate into an all out war is not something that uh, we can sort of predict with any degree of certainty but the fact is it would be unprofessional on our parts to say that a two front threat does not exist the fact is it exists today can the situation escalate uh, with the level of tensions that are there uh, on both the western and the northern border uh, we have to be prepared for a possibility of an escalation uh, we may not want it to happen but as i said it would really be unprofessional on the part of the indian military to say that it cannot happen and therefore we should not prepare for it uh, i not only a two front war people are also talking of a two and a half front because even as these two uh, borders both the both the western border the line of control and the line of actual control remain active we have an ongoing sort of insurgency uh, an ongoing uh, counter terrorist operation that is happening in jammu and kashmir uh, which uh, requires uh, you know uh, indian military to put assets on ground so we have we have uh, regular soldiers we have the rashtra rifles which is employed in counter terrorist operation Uh, and so we actually talk about even while these two fronts are active uh, we also have half a front uh, that is there in in, in jammu and kashmir uh, and therefore uh, the possibility is always there how would it play out uh, and here you know i'm uh, i'm a little cautious uh, i'm reminded of the word of uh, you know the us secretary of defense robert gates in 2011 he told west point cadets uh, that when it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagement since vietnam our record has been perfect we have never once gotten it right we had no idea a year before any of our missions that we would be so engaged so uh, predicting how uh, wars could take place uh, where would it take place is, is actually is actually difficult but the way the military looks at uh, you know looks at the scenarios that could play out in a in a in a two front is something that i will i will talk to you about uh let's first look at uh, uh, a war with pakistan uh, how uh, what are the what are the possibilities and what are the scenarios under which a war with pakistan could take place and it is felt uh, that the greatest likelihood of a conflict breaking out between india and uh, and pakistan would be the result of uh, a major terror strike uh, that takes place in india that in case pakistan continues with uh, support to terrorist activities uh, major attacks major incidents continue to take place uh, and really they test the the indian patients then india could feel that uh, this is unacceptable and therefore uh, there is a need to utilize our military resources uh, for an operation into pakistan we have done it on a limited scale as you know in the past Uh, the the latest incident being the the balakot strike of 2019 uh, which to some extent uh, did escalate although it didn't go into an all out war uh, but those are the kind of situations which could then lead uh, india and pakistan into a conflict if that happens uh, what could china do in all likelihood in a situation like this uh, international opinion is going to be on the indian side because as i said it would probably be a result of uh, you know india's patients being tested because of terrorist activities in india and therefore uh, it is our feeling and maybe it, it doesn't always play out in that way that uh, china is then unlikely to uh, initiate a major conflict uh, it would be sens- sensitive uh, you know to its own reputation as to why is it coming on the side of a of a state that is promoting terrorism and therefore uh, you could see some level of restraint uh, from china uh, having said that it doesn't mean uh, that china will not come to uh, some kind of indirect support 
as far as uh, Pakistan is concerned. So uh, you could see uh, directly, uh, you know, aid in terms of arms and equipment that China does. You could see, uh, for sure, some movements along the LAC. Uh, some incursions could take place. Uh, basically, the idea would be uh, to tie down Indian forces along the LAC so that reserves uh, from the uh, from the northern borders cannot be taken out completely and put against the Western Front against Pakistan. So the attempt on the Chinese side, while not engaging in a in a sort of full scale conflict, could well be to try and put some pressure on the northern front against uh, against India, so that some forces are engaged on the northern front and cannot be pulled out against uh, against China. That's the sort of uh, likelihood. You could also see increasing uh, presence of the PLA Navy in the Indian Ocean. And again, the idea would be, uh, look, keep some uh, naval assets sort of tied down uh, to looking after the PLA Navy assets so that the superiority of the Indian Navy cannot fully be employed against uh, Pakistan Navy. That's the sort of scenario uh, we visualize in the event of uh, India-China war, with uh, China taking these kind of actions, which will require some response from our side. I mean, uh, obviously, you cannot completely vacate the line of actual control along the northern borders and say, we are pulling out all our troops. Uh, against the against the Pakistan front. Conversely, uh, if there is a war with China, in all likelihood, it is going to be a war that is initiated by China. Uh, it is it is unlikely that India is going to initiate a conflict or war uh, with China. Uh, and again, what is going to be the level of the conflict uh, will depend on what are the likely Chinese objectives. So uh, if it's something like, look, we need to teach a lesson to India, uh, we need to keep them in their place, we need to keep them checked, we need to show that uh, China is the more superior power in Asia, you could see a limited conflict. If China has more expansive uh, geopolitical objectives, you could then see a war that breaks out all along the LAC. In such a contingency, what is Pakistan likely to do? In such a contingency, it is, uh, again, our, our assessment, I would say it's a personal assessment, that Pakistan could take advantage uh, of India's involvement in a war with, uh, with China to try and take advantage by launching uh, some kind of operation in Jammu and Kashmir uh, try and capture some territory. Uh, it says that Jammu and Kashmir is disputed territory. Uh, it doesn't accept uh, uh, Indian uh, Indian hegemony or, or not hegemony, but uh, you know the fact that JNK is a part of the Indian state. Uh, and so you could see Pakistan carrying out some kind of actions, military action. Uh, along the line of actual control, uh, sorry, along the line of control in, in Jammu and Kashmir, which will mean that apart from being engaged uh, in a war with China, you would also be engaged in almost uh, a full-scale conflict uh, with, uh, with Pakistan. And I say full-scale conflict because if we remain completely, completely defensive uh, on the Pakistan front, it could encourage Pakistan to take more and more action. And therefore, we will also have to uh, show, uh, carry out some kind of operations against Pakistan to say that, look, what you're doing in Jammu and Kashmir is not acceptable to us. And those operations may well be uh, in Punjab, Rajasthan, etc., and not necessarily confined to Jammu and Kashmir. So when you look at these two scenarios uh, of a, of a two-front war, uh, the scenario in which India is, is likely to find itself under pressure 
is a scenario when it's facing China as, as the primary uh, threat, at the same time being engaged with, uh, with Pakistan in conflict along the Western border. Uh, that really is, uh, uh, I would say for us would be, uh, in the military would be the most sort of challenging situation that, that we could have. Uh, so that's broadly, you know, the kind of scenarios uh, that, could, uh, that could sort of play out uh, in terms of uh, what the two, two front scenarios could, could look like. One, uh, a war with Pakistan where you might find sort of limited, uh, limited actions along the LAC uh, by, by China. Uh, mostly in order to tie down some troops uh, on the on the northern front so that we cannot deploy our full assets against Pakistan. And a full-scale war, the second scenario is a full-scale war with China, in which we would also be seriously engaged uh, on the Pakistan front uh, in the event that Pakistan attempts uh, to carry out uh, some actions, particularly in India and Kashmir. Uh, Avm Sena talked about uh, talked about diplomacy and what we would expect as far as the military is concerned uh, out of our diplomacy obviously uh, would be to ensure that one of our adversaries is kept under check uh, through diplomatic action that in case we are engaged in conflict on one side uh, that our diplomacy helps in keeping the second neighbor under check. That is, if you are engaged with, uh, uh, with, with China, then our diplomacy makes sure that uh, Pakistan doesn't enter the fray. And similarly, if you are engaged against Pakistan, our diplomacy ensures uh, that China does not do anything along the LAC. Uh, unfortunately, and I, I say this with responsibility, Currently, our diplomatic relations with both countries are, are not in a very good shape. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, we know there is absolutely zero diplomatic engagement. Uh, we don't even have high commissioners. Uh, there is no conversation, dialogue uh, that is happening at the diplomatic level between the two countries. The kind of uh, messages that are coming from Pakistan leadership uh, don't give you any confidence that uh, they are willing to sort of mend their ways and uh, engage uh, with India. Uh, and similarly with China, uh, unfortunately, since 2020, our relations have not been on the best of terms. So, and we are all seeing uh, seeing that what uh, you know what's happening. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, refusal to visit India for the G20 summit. And this whole issue of uh, you know stapled visas, border match that are being put out. Uh, so engagement, uh, although we are at some level talking to each other, uh, but even if you see the record of those those conversations, I mean, unfortunately, there there isn't a common understanding uh, of uh, you know what what the situation and what the problem is. And so, as I said, uh, diplomacy at least currently has its limit. Uh, in attempting to prevent, uh, as I said, a two-front war. And the second thing that we need to be sort of sensitive about is uh, that India has openly declared itself for uh, strategic autonomy and saying that, uh, you know, we will not be a part of any alliances. Uh, and while that is good, because uh, it's, a, it's a position that India has taken not only now, but also in the past when we you know, used to call it non-alignment. Uh, but what that means is that you really don't have any military allies. And therefore, when it uh, comes to situations where you could get into conflict with uh, China and Pakistan or both, uh, you are going to be completely, completely uh, dependent and relying on yourself. Uh, and so again, that's something that the military has to be conscious about, that uh, our capabilities that we build up uh, have to be in such a way that really nobody is coming to your assistance. You have to do this. Uh, you have to do this all on your own. Uh, so, assuming that we are engaged in a 
in a two front war what will it look like uh, and again i'm going to talk to you in very broad terms and you know not not talk specific about uh, what uh, the army air force or navy will do or what formation will do what where the where the war will take place i think very broadly and this is the uh, this is the military thinking that if we are to be engaged uh, in a two front war what we will need to do is designate uh, a primary and a secondary front uh, you know uh, the attempt to be strong everywhere uh, could actually mean that you are strong nowhere and so depending on whom you consider as the primary threat uh, so if the war is initiated by pakistan in all likelihood pakistan is going to be the primary front uh, in a war that is initiated uh, by china uh, that china could be a could could will be the primary front so you need to designate uh, look this is our primary front and this is our secondary front on the primary front you need to gather as much forces uh, as you can as i said it's going to be a two front situation so you just cannot denude uh, your secondary theater or your secondary front uh, but in an overall perspective when you look at force levels of the army navy air force you will say that these many forces and the majority of your forces will be designated to your primary front and the attempt will be uh, to win on the primary front and at the minimum achieve a stalemate on the secondary front make sure that even on your secondary front uh, the adversary is unable to achieve uh, a significant sort of victory so hold your secondary front while putting maximum resources uh, on the primary front and you might well ask uh, look if china is the primary front uh, can we uh, in the event of an all out war uh, actually achieve some kind of victory uh, on the primary front and i would say while if you look at look on the paper and you will uh, you know look at uh, numbers uh, you might feel that china has enormous superiority uh, they have many more aircraft much much larger navy uh, missile systems uh, the army is, is larger and you might uh, feel that look uh, isn't there an imbalance in force level uh, but i would suggest to you Uh, that terrain has has a great impact on the kind of war that is going to be fought along the line of axial control uh, so the war that is going to be fought is going to be fought along the himalayan watershed and the himalayan watershed is a is a major obstacle yes there have been infrastructure development so yes roads have got built but the high altitude the terrain uh, the weather imposes enormous and enormous uh, has an enormous impact on how uh, operations can be conducted and how many forces you can actually employ and similarly tibet from where uh, major operations will be launched uh, is a high altitude plateau uh, there are there are issues of uh, acclimatization there are issues of uh, you know aircraft taking off from there with their full loads uh, that altitudes they can't so the terrain imposes uh, enormous kind of restriction on as i said both the force level the build up of logistics uh, and on human endurance so let's not look only at uh, you know paper strength and say look china appears sort of much stronger than what uh, what india has and then if you look away from the continental front to the maritime theater the indian navy today still has a very dominant position in the indian ocean so while the pla navy on paper uh, may be the largest navy in the world in fact it is in terms of uh, in terms of uh, number of battleships the pla navy today is the largest navy in the world it has uh, it's more than more than the us navy 
but for the PLA Navy to come and operate in the Indian Ocean is still a challenge. And so the Indian Navy has a dominant position uh, today in the, in the Indian Ocean. And so uh, I, just, I just wanted to bring these points out. So just for those of you who, uh, who would be wondering uh, whether in a two-front situation, uh, can the Indian military hold its own along the line of active control? Uh, uh, I would say yes. Uh, there are there are areas in which capabilities are to be built up, uh, and I will I will come to that. Uh, fighting the the PLA is not going to be easy, and so capabilities need to be built up. Uh, but the differential, frankly, is is not so much uh, that it should uh, it should concern us. Uh, that the PLA will be just sort of like a walkover as far as the as far as the LAC is concerned. Uh, so that's the that's the scenario. Uh, as I said, the Navy will play a key role uh, in a in a two front scenario because it's still dominant in the Indian Ocean uh, and can uh, you know look after both uh, the Pakistan uh, and any threats that happen in the in the eastern indian ocean so the indian navy is going to play a key role uh, as far as a, as a, as far as the two front uh, conflict is concerned and so it's right when people say that you know we need to look at uh, building up our our navy uh, as i said is it going to be easy uh, not really because it's going to be possibly the biggest challenge that india can face uh, particularly if the primary front uh, is is China, uh, it's a it's a strong military. It's reorganized itself well since 2015. Uh, technologically, it has built itself up. As I said, the navy is uh, the navy is growing uh, growing strong, uh, and therefore uh, we will need to also look at uh, how to match uh, capabilities. Uh, how to create doctrines that help us successfully fight a two-front war. Uh, as we look ahead into the future, uh, it looks uh, apparent that uh, with the size of the Chinese economy, with the size of the defense budget, uh, which is three to four times uh, the size of the Indian budget, uh, and the resources that are going into building uh, the PLA, if we do not keep step, if we do not enhance our own capability, over the next uh, five to 10 years, we could find ourselves uh, in a very, very tricky position. And therefore, we need to start looking at how to develop capabilities, particularly keeping in mind that uh, the Chinese military threat today is more real uh, than it was. As I said earlier, the thinking was, look, we are not going to get into a military conflict with China. Uh, I think after 2020, uh, that notion has completely been disabused. So today we need to start looking at uh, Chinese front in a big way and also be conscious that in case we have a conflict with China, uh, there is a likelihood that the second front, which is the front with uh, Pakistan, could also uh, get activated. So let me come to the last part of my uh, my talk, which is on building our capabilities. And I think a simplistic sort of solution would be to say, look, let's increase our defense budget. We need uh, we need sixty squadrons of the air force. And this is the figure that has been given by uh, some strategic experts to say that in case you have to fight a full-fledged two-front war, you need 60 squadrons of the uh, aircraft of the, of the Air Force. You need 250 uh, ship Navy. You need a completely mod modernized uh, Indian Army. Uh, the reality is uh, we are not going to get these kind of figures. Uh, you are not going to get the, the kind of budget that would help you uh, build this. Uh, in fact, if you look at the defense budget uh, as a percentage of the GDP, 
the defense budget has actually been reducing. Uh, in 2020, our defense budget was 2.1% of the GDP, which as a percentage of the GDP was the lowest since 1960. Uh, after 2020, uh, you know, the budgets have increased. But I don't think we are going to see a very significant increase in the defense budget, uh, considering uh, that India is still a country, uh, you know, where millions are in poverty, uh, where social development infrastructure, civilian infrastructure needs to be built up. And therefore, there are limits to how much the government can give towards, uh, towards the defense budget. So what do we do? And I think so, therefore, you need to look at how is it that we can more efficiently utilize the resources that we have. Uh, and here, I, I'm not only referring to military resources, which I will come to later. I'm referring to national resources. Look, the fact is, uh, wars are not a military effort. Uh, wars are a national effort. And therefore, you need to start looking uh, in a holistic manner and how the nation uh, is going to sort of support and behave uh, during operation. And here I come to, uh, you know, something that, that uh, immediately sort of will strike you, uh, which is uh, how are we going to utilize our, what we call civilian armed police forces uh, during war. And these are, CRPF, BSF, ITPP, etc. These constitute our uh, CAPFs, as we call them. What are the numbers? Uh, they are more than a million strong, uh, almost the size of the entire Indian Army. Uh, we need to integrate them into our operational planning. Uh, today, unfortunately, uh, this is something that uh, that is has not happened and is not happening. Uh, for example, if you look at the indo tibet border police, it's deployed along the LAC uh, on the border with China, uh, along with the Indian Army. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both forces are under different ministries. So the ITBP is under Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, the Army is under the Ministry of Defense. There is also no clarity on how the ITBP will come under control of the army during operation. Uh, there is no real clarity on uh, how many CRPF uh, units will actually come to support the military, not fighting along the borders, but in what we call rear area security. Uh, securing your rear areas where you have your logistic dam, uh, securing your uh, routes of communication where your military convoys, et cetera, will go. So I think the first thing that we need to look at is you know, take all our uniform uh, resources, uh, and I'm not talking about the police, which is under state, but uh, the central police forces, and see how we can co-opt them better uh, in case of uh, conflicts and in case of wars that happen. Uh, and I've given you the example of, uh, of, of the IDPP and how we need to sort of integrate at least both these forces into our, into our operational planning. Uh, within the military too, uh, we need to look at a more efficient uh, management of resources. Uh, so this is a task that you know has been given to the uh, to the chief of defense staff. Uh, look at integrating logistics. Look at integrating resources. Uh, look at integrating training methods. I mean, why is it, for example, uh, for helicopter training, the same type of helicopter? Uh, the Air Force has a separate training school. The Army has a separate training school. If you look at air defense weapon system, the Air Force has their own air defense training school. The Army has an air defense training school. Some issues like that. Why can't we have common logistics? These are things I think we need to look at uh, and, and significantly uh, see how we can uh, jointly in in an integrated way, uh, combine certain aspects that can bring us, uh, you know, uh, more efficient utilization of the funds uh, that are 
uh, at our at our resources. As I said, uh, you know, let's let's not uh, let's not think that we will suddenly get enormous amounts of defense budget. But that's as I said, is not going to happen. That's one area where I think the military also needs to uh, look at. Uh, utilizing its resources uh, properly. Uh, and then, of course, uh, fighting a holistic battle uh, will mean integration of operational planning, integration of joint doctrine. Uh, how will resources be utilized in actual war fighting? Uh, and so we have been talking about the uh, creation of the integrated theater commands. It's now been, uh, you know, uh, it's almost three years when the proposal was was more than three years. In fact, when the proposal was first mooted, uh, and we still seem to be, uh, you know, debating, discussing. And I know this is an important issue, and uh, uh, we should not rush into it. But at the same time, uh, you know, we need to reach some kind of consensus between the three services uh, and at the political level on what we visualize as the future structure of the Indian military. Uh, and so integrate the theater command is something that uh, now needs to come in, uh, I would think uh, sooner rather than later. And we should not delay this, this uh, whole, whole process uh, too much. Uh, I know services have their own sort of reservation, uh, but if you look at uh, the overall advantages of, of integration, I think it's quite obvious that uh, we cannot continue uh, with our present planning system of planning and of planning in silos. And finally, uh, I will say we need much more uh, integration of uh, technology into the into the Indian military. Uh, we are uh, we are going about. Uh, inducting new technologies. Uh, but it's my personal view that it's it's happening, uh, you know, more in an incremental manner, uh, rather than uh, a massive intrusion of technology that is that is required. Uh, technology can can to some extent uh, help out, enhance increase your capability. I mean, we are, we are seeing, uh, we are seeing the Ukraine war, uh, the advantages of technology, uh, you know how drones are being uh, are being used uh, to attack targets as far as as far as Moscow by by Ukraine. The use of long range missiles. Uh, so technology is something also that we need to look at. Uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, autonomous systems, uh, greater greater employment of uh, of drones and UAVs. Uh, something that the military should uh, should be using. And I just want to add my last point here, that when we are looking at technology, it's not merely the position of technology that is important. It's important uh, that we have our strategies and doctrines in place of how we are going to use that technology. We can say, oh, artificial intelligence is important. How are we going to use it? Uh, so do we have a strategy in place? And finally, uh, do we have the organizational structures in place uh, to be able to uh, use those strategies? So these are some of my thoughts on how uh, I think a two-front situation could play out, uh, what are the possibilities, uh, what are the scenarios, and what uh, you know, sort of India needs to do uh, to build up its capabilities to be able to successfully prosecute a two-front uh, two war in future. So I'll end here, and if there are any questions, uh, I will take them. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thanks for this enlightening uh, discourse. And it is uh, as expected. A uh, lot of questions we have been bombarded. Sir. You did, <laughs> in the initial uh, subtle messages, uh, you did uh, assure us that in case we go for two front war, which may be imposed on us, there is a case of Israel that we can tilt the thing in our favor. And of course, you have said that for that military capability and the training standards needs to be high. So, uh, and you also touched uh, very uh, categorically that 
China's objective would be very, very limited because uh, maybe they uh, will initiate only if they want to teach India a lesson or China is superior, that message they have to come. Uh, until unless they go for the expansionist agenda, which is very likely to be there. Sir, you have uh, uh, given the contour also. You said that this initiation of war, in case it happens from the China side, you said that it may happen in the Himalayan watershed, that is the fault line, or maybe uh, from the Tibet, the high altitude plateau, both have got terrain in position and restrictions. Also, maritime uh, uh, arena is one, which is very likelihood. And you also assured that we have our Indian Navy is in a shape where it can take the PLA. And, and you did set up capability build up how uh, you touched upon the how integration is required and very, very rightly, sir, the civil armed forces should be integrated, which still not very clear. Uh, theater command integration, other capability build up. Sir, one uh, issue which uh, because of positive time you have not touched, uh, though you gave a hint that our main philosophy is strategic autonomy. And we don't go for any military alliances. But the question which has been raised and from our regular viewer, uh, <clears throat> uh, Sri ji, that uh, we are the member of Quad. And also, we have emerged as a champion of South South uh, alliances or whatever you say. Uh, and in case we go for, in case some certain eventuality happens, Will this Quad Alliances or South South uh, uh, countries, um, Brazil or Venezuela or Brazil or South Africa or even the Middle East, can leverage their power for intervention? Sir, your comment on this. Okay, so let me just talk about. Uh, let me put this. Uh, you know, Global South uh, and our relations with the Middle East countries and BRICS, etc. Uh, look, these are these are not these are not military alliances, uh, and I think we should not expect uh, that any of these uh, would come to our military aid in case of a conflict with uh, uh, with China. Uh, as far as Quad is concerned, again, it's been a stated Indian position that the Quad is not a military alliance. Uh, it is it is a meeting of of like minded countries who want to see an open and free Indo Pacific. Uh, yes, uh, in in some ways, uh, it is a it is a grouping that seeks to curtail Chinese behavior. That look, we do not accept uh, Chinese aggression uh, in the Indo Pacific, and so we seek to curtail this behavior. Uh, I know there are uh, naval exercises, joint exercises that take place, uh, but again, to expect that. Uh, uh, the Australian Navy or the Japanese Navy uh, is going to start a shooting war with China uh, in case India and China are engaged. They could support you with things like intelligence, intelligence gathering. The US will certainly give you intelligence about, about what is happening. They could help you with logistics. They could help you with some arms supply. But look, let us not expect that these are people who are going to come uh, to your direct military aid are we going to see U.S. boots on the ground in Ladakh? Uh, the answer is no. So at the end of the day, yes, we can depend on them for a few things, uh, but the battle has to be fought by us. And I think uh, we, we should therefore build capabilities accordingly. The battle has to be fought by us, only, sir. And they all will be the fair weather friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sir, uh, uh, you did comment on the future technologies that we should leverage. Uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, cyber, electronic warfare, and until we integrate all these things in our capability buildup, uh, we cannot take on the China. The question of by our one of the regular viewer Vijay Rai ji is again: Are we capable technologically to take on two front war? <laughs> uh, one and your comment, sir. We have to build up. Yeah. Look, look, look. We. Uh... Are we, are we even suggesting that in case a two-front war happens, the Indian military is going to collapse and it's not going to fight now? Let's, let's, not, uh, let's not get uh, uh, get away with that kind of impression. Uh, 
uh, over a period of time, we have built up our capabilities both on the northern front and on the on the western front uh, to be able to prosecute war. Uh, we are training for it. These are situations that are war game. Uh, the Indian military, uh, you know, I was seeing the global sort of five part index that has just come out in 2023. Uh, India is uh, considered the fourth strongest military in the world. So let's not assume it's something that is going to collapse. We need technology. Uh, unfortunately, and I say this, uh, technology adoption in the military has not been as quick and fast as we want it to be. And therefore, it's time that, you know, even now we are looking at it uh, in a big way. Uh, we are now incorporating more and more uh, civil technologies, the civil industry, uh, uh, the academia, et cetera, into, into uh, you know, ensuring that we get the latest technology. Uh, this is something that we need to look at very, 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 very seriously. Uh, it's happening today. I just hope uh, it, it gains space. Uh, we are able to do much more civil military integration into this. Uh, today, the talk is, you know, earlier, it used to be military technology that used to lead the way. And then the technology had spin-offs in the civil sector. Uh, today, unfortunately, just the reverse. It's civil technology that is being adopted increasingly uh, into the military. And therefore, we need to look at it like that and not say that you know, defense technology is something that is completely separate and that we need to develop it ourselves. Uh, look at uh, driverless cars, autonomous cars, for example, is something that is developed out in the civil sector much before it is adopted into the military. Artificial intelligence, uh, quantum warfare, these are things that are, we need spin-offs from the civil industry. And I, I'm glad that it is happening that there's more and more engagement uh, you know, that is taking place. True, sir. Uh Technology we are uh, inducting, but very uh, rightly and aptly said, sir, technology is not going to uh, make you win the war, may assist you, and uh, the last bullet has to be fired by the people only, by the troops, and that is where we will, <clears throat> we can match. That is very assuring thought, sir. We will not going to collapse very soon. And uh, one question which has come, sir, again, uh, uh, on economic front, uh, Madam Sumitra ji asking, both Pakistan is economically destroyed, China's economic power is dec on decline. So will they venture for different war? Look, as I said, uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, they are, they are uh, looking at uh, any war with, with India. And that's why the situation that I brought out was in all likelihood, if there's going to be conflict with Pakistan, it is going to be initiated by, uh, by India. In fact, uh, Pakistan would like uh, that they continue with whatever they're doing, terrorist activities in Kashmir, without uh, you know, engaging in a war with, uh, with India. So uh, I, I don't see Pakistan uh, engaging in a full, initiating a full-scale conflict with India. Uh, although, as they say, gray zone warfare, uh, Subconventional warfare is something uh, that they will continue uh, as long as it remains below the threshold of, of war. As far as China is concerned, and I think they could well do it. I mean, what, uh, what happened in 2020 was uh, the use of military force uh, in an attempt to coerce India. I mean, they brought in 50, 60,000 soldiers in Ladakh, uh, carried out uh, you know, sort of intrusions across multiple uh, multiple uh, areas. Of course, it did not go into a conflict, uh, but definitely the use of military force uh, as coercion, as an attempt to pressurize India, is something that we've already seen in 2020. So I think uh, it is something that that they could attempt in the future. Uh, will they, with their economy in the state, it is. Uh, Yes, the, the uh, Chinese economy is under, under pressure. Uh, but let's also, let's also understand, uh, I mean, it's, the economy is huge, much, much larger than, uh, than India. And even if it grows slowly, uh, we don't see India catching up with China in the next 20 years. And similarly, 
uh, the resources that they allocate to their military is much, much larger and will continue to be much larger than India. Uh, and so I don't see that as, uh, you know, putting major restrictions on China on the use of military force. I think they will still continue to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a question, uh, of course, this is, what is the significant tech gap between India and China uh, that you have already uh, answered, sir? And what is the update on integrating new CDS? <laughs> uh, so, sir has already touched upon how we require and the theater command integration is uh, in the offing and it should happen as early as possible. We can't give any update. Sir, one uh, question, uh, and uh, they are asking that since you have been there as a Northern Army commander, uh, how do you see after abrogation of 370 uh, thing in situation in JNK, has it improved? So that we should still ask you. Hey, so if you look, uh, so if you look at purely uh, security parameters, uh, you can you can certainly say uh, that the situation has improved. Uh, violent incidents have gone down. Uh, number of terrorists have gone down. Uh, the fatality deaths that took place uh, in, in counter-terrorist operations uh, have gone down from 2019 to now 2022-23. Local recruitment has reduced. You are seeing uh, a development taking place, and you are seeing um, this year. I think uh, 1.8 crore tourists is what they're talking about have have visited. So uh, stone building is not there. Street protests are not there. So as far as the security situation is concerned, there is a definite, definite improvement, and and we can say that is everything normal. And I think. Uh, that's something that requires a more sort of deliberate analysis because if everything was normal, you would have held elections. I mean, uh, it's been five years since we've not been able to hold elections in Jammu and Kashmir. So I would say the security situation has significantly, significantly improved. Uh, but let us not also say everything and everything in Jammu and Kashmir is now completely, completely normal. So that normalization will come play, take place uh, when elections take place and when the people of uh, Kashmir uh, fully accept that they are an integral part of India, when radicalization reduces. So there are there, there is some uh, some distance to go, but the security situation 100% has improved significantly. So last but not the least, though you have given the uh, caution that it's always hazardous to predict about war, uh, the question is, which country is more unpredictable, Pak or China? So one line up, sir. <laughs> <laughs> look, look. I think, I, I think, if you look at unpredictability, uh, I would say China today, because of the kind of uh, aggressive behavior that we are seeing from the country. Pakistan is, is more predictable. You know, this is what they're mm -hmm. going to do. They will kind of do, do some little bit of infiltration. They will make noise about their, about Jammu and Kashmir. They'll make noise about the nuclear, uh, you know, weapons, et cetera, et cetera. So China is, China is really, really unpredictable. Uh, and as, as we go and look into the future, uh, how not only the India-China competition, but how the US-China competition will play out and how it will have its impact on uh, regional countries in the U.S. Is, is something that we need to really uh, you know, assess and, and analyze. So, so definitely China in, in my view. True, sir. True. Uh, we understand Pakistani very well and China remains in uh, <laughs> under the OPEC uh, uh, shield, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks for this illuminating talk. Uh, over to you, madam. Yes, so I did receive a few more questions, General Sir, but mm -hmm. I think uh, we we are not sharing that as of now. Maybe we can send you a, a note and we can reply back to the audience. Sure, well. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you. So first of all, I thank Lieutenant General Huda Sir for joining us today. It was a very interesting discussion and I'm sure the audiences were kept glued. We hope to see you, Sir, back on this platform soon once again.
I wish to thank AVM Pranay Sena for moderating this session beautifully. Also, I express my gratitude to him uh, on behalf of everyone in CKS for meticulously planning the five seasons so far of the SPEG Generals. And today we conclude the uh, fifth part of this uh, particular season. Um, so uh, we had the privilege of listening to Lieutenant General Huda today. It's a great honor. Last but not the least, I wish to thank all our viewers who have joined us on this platform and also who are watching us on the other channels. Please do follow us on social media for upcoming programs. Jai Hind and thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, sir. Good day. Jai Hind and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Abhiram yeah. Sana, and thank you, Samantha. Thank you very much, and all the best to your viewers. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.